This is podcast number 31. All right, we've been talking about how the cell uh, walks through these different checkpoints in the cell cycle, and I gave you a couple mechanisms for that in the last podcast and some more in this podcast. So there's a, a protein called RB, it stands for retinoblastoma. It's named for a cancer uh, that is a childhood cancer where there's a defect in this protein, in this signaling system. And retinoblastoma protein, RB protein, normally uh, inhibits a transcription factor, E2F, uh, that is required for transcription of genes that are needed for the S phase, such as DNA polymerase. So you need DNA polymerase to copy your DNA in the S phase. Uh, E2F is required to transcribe the gene for DNA polymerase and other genes uh, that are needed in tran um, in copying your DNA. Uh, but when RB is bound to e E2F, that is inhibited because you don't want to go through the S phase until you're in the S phase. Uh, when a growth factor arrives on the outside of the cell, say in the blood, and it triggers a uh, cell signaling pathway. Uh, this one happens to be called RAS. If you want to know more about that, we'll talk lots about that in cell physiology. Uh, RAS will activate a cyclin-dependent kinase uh, through its cyclin, and that CDK cyclin will be active to phosphorylate um, uh, substrates. One of the substrates that they phosphorylate is RB. And when RB is phosphorylated, it no longer binds to E2F. E2F can then be active in transcribing genes that are required for um, uh, duplicating your DNA. So uh, normally uh, RB is inhibiting this process. When you do want to duplicate your DNA, such as you want to grow, uh, then uh, RB is... Um, <clears throat> stopped from inhibiting E2F by virtue of being phosphorylated. So you can imagine that if this pathway where you're duplicating your DNA was on in your cells at an inappropriate time, that that could cause cancer or uncontrolled cell growth. So it's important to duplicate your DNA, but only when you want to do it, not all the time. Uh, another issue is uh, that during the S phase, you want to duplicate your DNA once and only once. So uh, as we mentioned when we were talking about replication bubbles, that there are thousands of origins of replication in a linear uh, chromosome, and they all are working at the same time so that you can really duplicate your DNA in a cell in just a matter of minutes. So what's to prevent your cell from duplicating it more than once, and that would be a bad thing. So if you go from um, one copy of everything to two copies of everything, well, that's fine because you're going to go from one cell to two cells. But if you go from one copy to three copies or one copy to four copies, um, that would not be good. You would get too much DNA in your duplicated cells. So what you want to be able to do is license your DNA to be copied only once once and only once. And that happens during G1. Uh, so what happens is these proteins ORC and MCM bind at the origins of replicase, uh, origins of, of replication, including uh, with helicase loaders, uh, and they are ready to go to be replicated once the cell enters S. Once the cell enters S, um, the DNA polymerase and other protein-making uh, machinery in that trombone diagram we talked about will physically knock off uh, the helicase loaders and ORC as it travels through the bubble. And not only that, but there will be a cyclin-dependent kinase active during S that will phosphorylate um, these proteins, ORC and helicase, uh, so that they can't reattach um, at new bubbles of origin. 
uh, and then they're uh, dephosphorylated uh, during uh, mitosis so that they can get relicensed in G1 in the two new daughter cells. So uh, this licensing happens during G1. The licensing means, go ahead, you are uh, permitted to duplicate your DNA. That duplication happens during S. And during the duplication, you knock off the licensing proteins, ORC and helicase, um, but not MCM uh, right away. Um, in addition, you uh, phosphorylate ORC and helicase, um, these helicase loaders, during uh, the S phase so that they can't reattach. And then you will dephosphorylate them again in later phases of the cell cycle so that it can happen again in the next G1. There is another protein called geminin that is involved in the licensing system. Geminin is involved in the, the G1 phase in um, forming this licensing complex, uh, but then is destroyed uh, in the SG2M phase, again, so that it can't uh, happen more than once per cell cycle. So this is a pretty cool system that has evolved uh, that allows your DNA to be duplicated once per cell cycle, um, this whole thing being the cell cycle, and that's it. Okay, here's a H5P question for you. Uh, what about um, in anaphase, uh, if you don't have your kinetochore microtubules attached to the kinetochore on each one of your sister chromatids facing opposite ways, you could end up in trouble. So even if you don't have anything attached, then that um, that chromosome is not going to migrate, and you'd have uh, un, um, uh, you might be missing that chromosome in the daughter cells. Or if it only attaches to one side and not the other side, they may all get pulled onto one side. So uh, what happens is there is these inhibitory uh, proteins called MAD and BUB um, that are in the vicinity of where the anaphase promoting complex would operate. So the anaphase promoting complex, once it's active, uh, is going to um, cut this uh, protein connection between sister chromatids so that you end up with two separate chromatids, one going this way and one going that way after anaphase. That's why it's called the anaphase promoting complex. But you don't want that cutting to happen until you actually have uh, the um, uh, kinetic core microtubules attached because then there's nothing to drag them away. So these MAD and BUB proteins attach at the same place where the action of this separase is going to work right, right there, okay, uh, and uh, they will inhibit uh, the anaphase hormonal complex uh, from operating until a kinetochore uh, microtubule attaches and displaces the MAD and the BUB proteins, so that now this uh, anaphase hormonal complex can be active um, and. Uh, and you can get past anaphase. So if MAD and BUB are there, that means that there is no kinetic or microtubule attached. Once a kinetic or microtubule attaches, um, they'll get knocked off. If MAD and BUB are there, they're going to inhibit the anaphase promoting complex um, active uh, subunit. And then once MAD and BUB are gone, then there's nothing preventing the anaphase promoting complex from becoming active. And um, uh, activating separase, which is going to break this cohesin protein and allow those to separate. So once again, uh, this is a checkpoint to, to make sure that um, before you go through anaphase, you have kinetic core microtubules attached to each one of those sister chromatids and each chromosomes, um, and it'll uh, cause the cell to wait until that happens before it activates the anaphase hormonal complex because you don't want to go through anaphase unless your um, unless your um, chromosomes are attached to microtubules. Here is some immunostating for bub 
which is one of these uh, weight signals. And this is on an unattached, oops, unattached chromosome out here that you see bub. Okay. Uh, another sort of checkpoint, not sort of checkpoint, another definite checkpoint is after uh, you've been hanging out in G1 or if you're a terminally, di terminally differentiated cell, you might be in uh, G0 uh, for a long period of time. And during that long period of time, you can be exposed to forces in the environment, say solar radiation or something like that, that could mutate the DNA. And this is DNA that you do not want to replicate if it's been mutated until you fix it. So uh, DNA uh, damage will activate a, a system called ATM or ATR, depends on the type of damage that it is, okay? And uh, that will activate a kinase. Uh, now normally there is a protein called P53. Um, P53 is a tetramer, uh, four different subunits shown here, one, two, three, four. And uh, P53 normally is made to die. So that you make P53, uh, it gets ubiquitin attached to it by MDM2, and then it degrades. And it degrades by the mechanism that we talked in the, about in the last podcast, where it goes to the proteasome and gets chopped to bits because it's been attached to ubiquitin. And that's the normal situation. Uh, you have P53, uh, and then you destroy P53. If there's been activation of this system, that means some DNA damage has happened, and these kinases will phosphorylate P53, and when P53 is phosphorylated, it can't be ubiquitinylated by MDM2. So this is... Uh, P53 then gets stabilized, and as it gets made, it builds up. So in this situation, normal, healthy situation, no DNA damage, P53 is made and destroyed. When there has been DNA damage, you activate a kinase that adds phosphates onto the P53. MDM2 can no longer um, uh, add ubiquitin to P53, and so P53 builds up inside the cell. It will bind to DNA. Uh, it's a DNA binding protein. And it will activate uh, transcription of genes such as PD P21, which is a cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor. And that will inhibit the action of a particular cyclin, uh, CDK. And that will not phosphorylate the RB protein. And as we saw back here, if you don't phosphorylate the RB protein, then you don't go into the S phase because you, you're not making the enzymes for the S phase. So you're inhibited. Okay? And during cell cycle arrest, so let's say the cell had made a decision that they wants to go into S, uh, P53 can stop that from happening and actually recruit DNA repair mechanisms to the site of where that repair is needed, such as the mechanisms that you learned about for the last test, non-homologous end joining, um, uh, SDSA, etc. Okay? And it'll hold in that cell cycle arrest to see can the DNA be repaired. If the answer is no, the DNA can't be repaired, uh, it's too big a um, uh, mutation, uh, and we don't have the mechanisms to repair it. In that case, P53 can activate transcription of a gene called Puma, which will inhibit a um, channel in the outer mitochondrial membrane called BCL2, which will start a cascade of events that leads to cell death, and this is called apoptosis, and we'll talk about that in this podcast. So, um, there's been DNA damage. If there, uh, if the DNA damage is not too bad, you'll stop the cell uh, cycle where it is and recruit 
DNA repair mechanisms to the spot where the DNA damage has happened. And if you fix it, you go on with the cell cycle. If you can't fix it, you activate uh, a system that's going to kill the cell. Um, all of these things here are very potent oncogenes. In fact, P53 is the most commonly mutated protein in all human cancers. Uh, it's very, very likely that any person diagnosed with a cancer has a mutation in their P53 gene. Uh, this, how I describe this, is that um, there are just some genes that are more likely to accumulate mutations than others. If you drive an old beater car, as a college kid, you may be more likely to drive an old beater car, but you know, having been the driver of this old beater car, what's going to break because it's already broken before. And it's, and maybe even that car, that model of car is famous for that thing breaking. For my first beater car, it was the brake calipers would always get stuck. And P53 is sort of like that in your genome. It's just something that is more likely to break than the rest of your DNA. The other problem is that you need four good copies of P53 in order to make a functional protein. And if only one of them is messed up, it can mess up all the other ones. So if only one of these four P53 uh, proteins has a mutation in it, you can't make a functional version of P53. Okay. Uh, okay. So there are some uh, interesting observations that have come from this, and that is how do big animals get around this problem? So most of the mutations happen during cell division. We talked about that uh, before. The last, uh, the last test. In duplicating your DNA, that's the most likely time that you're going to make a mistake. And if you are an elephant, you have a much bigger body than if you are a person or if you're a microbe. And it's bigger by virtue of having more cells. The cells aren't bigger. You just have lots more cells. So if you have lots more cells, that means you've done a whole lot more mitosis. Um, when you start off as a single-celled embryo, and turning into an elephant during development. You did a lot more mitosis than a human or a dog or a flower, for example. So how is it that they avoid cancer? They actually have a very low rate of cancer for a long-lived animal. They have 20 copies of the P53 gene. Uh, so uh, this gene has, co has been copied 20 separate times in their genome. And therefore, if um, they get a mutation in one of those copies, it's likely that the other 19 copies um, can dilute the effects of that one bad copy. Uh, having said that, it's not true for all big animals. So whales uh, have normal numbers of copies of P53 uh, genes. Um, so this is a solution, but it's not the only solution if you're going to be big. Okay, so we've talked about different sorts of checkpoint mechanisms, checkpoints being these bars over the cell cycle. So the anaphase promoting complex uh, in anaphase of uh, mitosis, um, that you have this uh, complex that um, activates a uh, protease that's going to cut the connection between sister chromatids and this complex has to be um, activated only if those uh, MAD and BUB proteins say it's okay because the kinetic core microtubules are attached. Uh, in the G1 cyclin, G1 cyclin dependent kinase, you can activate uh, the RB system the RB system is normally going to inhibit cells from um, duplicating their DNA because it's sitting on top of a transcription factor that is required to synthesize um, those transcripts. Uh, and um, 
and it has to be phosphorylated in order for that transcription factor to become active. Uh, there's a licensing system that allows you to duplicate your DNA. Uh, you get licensed during G1, and then you lose your license uh, during S, and you only get one license per one trip around this cell cycle. Um, when you make daughter cells, you can relicense in those daughter cells, but that would be another cell cycle. Uh, and then uh, the mitotic cyclins, we talked about how, as an example, the phosphorylation of lamins in the nuclear envelope uh, causes the nuclear lamins to break down, uh, promoting entrance into prophase. So this is not all there is to say, but these are several examples of how the cell quote-unquote decides to go into the next part of the cell cycle. And if things haven't happened correctly, what's going to happen is the cell will go through apoptosis. So apoptosis uh, is programmed cell death. And for most cells, there is a growth factor that needs, sorry, growth th factor that needs to arrive on the outside of the cell, bind to a growth factor receptor all the time, 24-7. And if that growth factor does not arrive, um, then this is the default pathway that you will go to cell death. So the growth factor arrives. Um, there's a protein called BAD that gets phosphorylated. And if BAD stays phosphorylated, then cell death is inhibited. If these growth factors don't arrive on time, um, and that uh, receptor is not occupied by its growth factor ligand, um, then this pathway is activated uh, all the time. So this is like having your um, finger constantly down on the trigger, and if for some reason you fall asleep and you let go, then the, the suicide pathway of the cell is activated. So normally we think about something arriving on the outside of the cell and then something happening. In this case, if the something doesn't arrive on the outside of the cell, that's what happens. Cell uh, Program cell death is different from cell death that happens by necrosis or from disease uh, in that it's a very regular pathway. And uh, if you look at it under, cell, uh, under scope, you'll see that the cell divides into different little um, parts and these different little parts get sucked up by a phagocytic cell like a uh, white blood cell uh, versus the cell just dissolving into goo uh, if it was um, dying by necrosis. Also, if you look at cells that are uh, undergoing apoptosis, their DNA, uh, this is an agarose gel, uh, intact DNA would be a very large molecule up near the top of the gel and DNA that has been, um, uh, is going through apoptosis will have very regular cuts in the DNA creating this ladder-like uh, effect versus uh, a, a cell that has, is going through necrosis, just dying um, because it's dying uh, and not because of programmed cell death or apoptosis, it would have a smear and you wouldn't see individual bands there. It would just be degrading um, little bit by little bit uh, as a smear and instead of d discrete cuts made at certain spots in the DNA. Uh, a lot of programmed cell death was worked out in C. elegans. Uh, yeah. These are two C. elegans embryos. Uh, these are about a millimeter size worm. Here's one end of it and it's curled around here curled around like that inside this embryo. But these are Namarsky optics where you can see on these white arrows there are certain cells that are uh, that look like they're bumping up. These are cells that are going through apoptosis. Um, C. elegans have this unique property called utile in that they have a defined number of cells as adults. I think it's 948. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, these are non-gonad cells, so not we're not talking about eggs or sperm, but all somatic cells um, have a defined number. And because of that, 
you can track the fate of each cell in C. elegans um, uh, from a fertilized embryo all the way through adult and say this cell turned into that, turned into that. And that allowed uh, scientists to say this particular cell is going through programmed cell death and then identify what genes are active in that particular cell. And that's how these um, uh, pathways were worked out. So this is called CED1. This is called C. elegans death uh, mutant uh, in this particular case. And once it was worked out in C. elegans, um, the homologous proteins were found in mammals and uh, found out to be extremely important in cancer research, for example. So uh, cell death it is a not necessarily a bad thing. So if things are going bad in a cell, uh, you want to be able to dispose of that cell and not cause harm to the whole organism. And so there are several ways to activate cell death. So this pathway here, starting with number four, is what we're going to start with first. And that's the thing that I have been talking about. So there's an external cell receptor that's facing the outside of the cell. Normally, that would bind a growth factor. Uh, if that growth factor does not arrive, then death-promoting proteins, which are inhibitors of inhibitors. So there is a channel in the outside of the outer mitochondrial membrane that is normally inhibited from uh, forming a pore. Um, and when that inhibition stops, because this pathway says, okay, I did not get my growth factor today, I'm going to stop inhibiting that pathway, this channel then forms in the outer mitochondrial membrane, and cytochrome C leaves the mitochondria. This is cytochrome C that's part of the electron transport chain, cytochrome C that you might have isolated in a biochem lab that is bright orange pigment. Um, that same old cytochrome C is an important signal in apoptosis. It's not supposed to be in the cytoplasm. If it is in the cytoplasm, bad things are happening. So um, it's released from the mitochondria as a signal that bad things are happening, and that cytochrome C will bind to an, an adapter protein, which activates what's called a caspase cascade. So caspases are aspartate-dependent proteases, uh, and essentially uh, it, they assemble into this giant wheel of death called an apatosome that is going to activate all kinds of chopping enzymes. Uh, enzymes that will chop up the protein and the DNA of the cell in a very regular fashion. And that's why you see that ladder uh, in cells going through apoptosis, and that's why you see those discrete blobs of organelles instead of just goo. Um, okay, so that's um, one way to activate this pathway. Uh, another way to activate this pathway is... Um, that your immune system can activate this pathway through death receptors. So there's cytotoxic T cells, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which can activate a specific death receptor um, on cells, can target cells, uh, particular cells, if something bad is happening, such as if they're infected with coronavirus, um, and then uh, start a cascade, cascade uh, caspase cascade, sorry, that's hard to say, caspase cascade, where one aspartate-dependent protease activates another aspartate-dependent protease, and so on, and, uh, and then eventually um, activate the apatosome, which will kill the cell in a very regular fashion. And then there's a, another one down here uh, that we talked about with P53, and that is if there's been massive DNA damage um, that can't be repaired from cell cycle arrest and recruiting those DNA repair mechanisms, then you transcribe a protein, a, a gene called Puma, which turns into a protein called Puma, 
that can also activate uh, this um, uh, apoptosis pathway. So at least three ways, uh, three is good enough for this class to activate apoptosis. Um, this is another pathway that, if mutated, can lead to cancer. Because the whole idea is to cut your losses. Something bad has happened to the cell. It's infected. It's got some massive DNA damage. Uh, or um, it's, uh, what was the, th let's see, infected, massive DNA damage. Or, yeah, it's no longer receiving growth factor. So maybe there's something wrong with the blood supply. Uh, this is not something you want to replicate um, because that could affect the organism. Um, the DNA is not going to be intact. And so you want to kill off that cell um, because cells are, in general, expendable. Organisms are not. So if parts of this pathway are broken, um, mutated because of... Uh, some kind of cancer-causing mutation, then, uh, then the cell is not killed and the cell does get to replicate and that can lead to uncontrolled cell growth or cancer. Okay, another H5P question for you.